Allow me to share a personal experience. I'm a 26-year-old non-binary individual with a disability accompanied by my service dog in training whom I affectionately call Buddy. Buddy has been trained to alert me when my heart rate becomes dangerously high, preventing me from fainting. Additionally, he provides deep pressure therapy to help stabilize my blood pressure and heart rate. Although these are his main tasks, Buddy is capable of much more. Before continuing the story, it's important to understand the laws regarding service dogs. According to the federal ADA law, to qualify as a service dog, the handler must have a disability, which I do, and the dog must be trained to perform at least one specific task. Furthermore, in my state within the United States, service dogs in training possess the same rights as fully trained service dogs. They are permitted to accompany their handlers anywhere the general public is allowed, without discrimination. Now, let's delve into the story. Buddy was in the midst of his first year of training, which typically spans between two to three years. My partner and I, with the assistance of a professional trainer, were actively involved in his training. Our goal was to expose Buddy to various public environments, and on this particular day, we decided to practice at a local credit union where I held an account. As we entered, Buddy maintained a perfect heel by my side. Our intention was to train him to lay under my legs while I sat in a chair. To get the attention of a bank employee, I offered a friendly smile. She approached us and introduced herself as a manager. However, she immediately diverted her attention towards Buddy instead of addressing me directly, which is a significant breach of protocol. Attempting to redirect her focus, I made several unsuccessful attempts to gain her attention as she continued to engage with Buddy. Being a young dog still in training, Buddy grew excited in response. Swiftly, I corrected his behavior with a firm command of leave it. Finally, the manager acknowledged my presence. Seizing the opportunity, I politely inquired if it would be permissible for us to utilize the chairs in the public lobby for our training session. To my surprise, she froze momentarily before uttering, No, I'm afraid I can't allow that. Only certified service dogs are permitted. This statement is erroneous for several reasons, as there is no legally required certification, and thus it is unlawful to request one. Promptly, I interjected, informing her, actually, in this state, service dogs in training possess the same rights as fully trained ones. Caught off guard, she stumbled over her words and eventually conceded, well, he can stay then. Not wishing to escalate the situation, I agreed, suggesting that we engage in alternative training activities. However, the manager immediately displayed a defensive demeanor and retorted, I cannot permit any training activities in the building. That is strictly prohibited. Recognizing this as a clear violation of my rights, I concocted an excuse, stating that I needed to check a transaction, merely to maintain our presence. Throughout my visit, she remained in close proximity, shadowing our every move. It was evident that she intended to remove us from the premises solely because I had a service dog. Once I reached the bank booth, I engaged with the teller, requesting her assistance in retrieving a seemingly insignificant transaction from earlier in the month. I explained that the company never provided me with a receipt, so I needed her to print it for me. The process, including locating the transaction and getting the printers to cooperate, took approximately 30 minutes. Throughout this time, I seized the opportunity to continue training Buddy on how to remain in one place during a transaction and ignore distractions from others. After finally obtaining the printed document, I expressed my sincere gratitude to the teller for her kindness and shot a subtle glance in the manager's direction. The manager... Realizing her actions had not gone unnoticed, inquired if I required any further assistance and whether I would be leaving. Although I contemplated engaging in some petty behavior, such as asking about refinancing my car, Buddy was growing bored, so I simply replied, No, thank you, and departed. The manager did not bid me farewell or wish me a nice day. Following that unpleasant experience, I knew I had to take action to address the issue. Recognizing that this credit union valued its customers, I decided to contact their corporate customer complaints line. Within a minute, I connected with a courteous gentleman on the other end. I recounted the entire ordeal, citing each ADA law and state statute that the manager had violated. 
The gentleman assured me that he would promptly investigate the matter and placed me on hold for approximately five minutes. When he returned, he not only confirmed the breaches of the mentioned laws, but also acknowledged that the manager had violated all of them based on my account. He emphasized, this is a very serious matter. I cannot simply let it go. Curious about the potential outcome, I asked him what would happen next. He explained that it was likely a higher-ranking individual would visit the credit union to educate all staff members on ADA guidelines and accommodating disabled customers. Satisfied with this response, I thanked him for his assistance and concluded the call. Fast forward six months to the present day. My service dog just left yesterday to undergo intensive training at his professional trainer's house, leaving me without a dog by my side. Nevertheless, I needed to deposit some cash, so I made my way to the credit union. Upon entering, I found myself next in line, about to approach the teller's booth, and to my surprise, it was her. The once mean and unpleasant manager had been demoted to a regular bank teller, Concealing my amusement, I wore a wide smile as I walked up to her booth. Unbeknownst to her, she didn't recognize me at all. I felt an overwhelming urge to burst into maniacal laughter, but instead, I chose to compliment her on her hair. Swiftly completing my transaction, I exited the credit union only to encounter a new, kinder manager near the door who genuinely wished me a pleasant day. The past two years have been challenging for me. I was living in British Columbia when my girlfriend, who is now my fiancé, got pregnant, and we were blessed with a beautiful little boy. However, due to overstaying my visa, I had to return to the United States. Crossing the border back into Canada became a troublesome ordeal. Our baby was too young to travel, so we patiently waited, contemplating our options. Eventually, we decided to pursue permanent residency, and a lawyer recommended by my fiancé's cousin seemed like the solution. And so, the nightmare began. We invested $6,000 and embarked on a lengthy process of paperwork with its inevitable back and forth and countless hoops to jump through. As we neared the end, we discovered that the lawyer had forgotten to obtain several crucial documents, such as sponsorship paperwork, among other essentials. I initially thought it wasn't a major setback and that we could rectify the situation by submitting the missing papers promptly. However, the first red flag appeared when the lawyer casually mentioned crossing the border illegally as an option to be with my family. It was disconcerting to find myself explaining to my own lawyer that this was not a viable solution. A month later, after finally clearing the consulate in Seattle, my paperwork was on its way to my home. One day, my fiancé called me in tears when the expected package failed to arrive, and she had called the consulate to inquire about the delay. To our shock, she discovered that the lawyer had contacted the consulate, requesting a change of address to my fiancé's location in British Columbia. Curious, I immediately called the lawyer, expressing my disapproval and informing her that she had deceived the consulate. We promptly reported her actions to the consulate, clarifying the truth. As if that wasn't enough, she then suggested that I should illegally cross the border to retrieve the package from my fiancé, assuring me that everything would be fine since my permanent residency, PR card, and number were in the package. I was left speechless, trying to process the magnitude of her misguided suggestions. I pointed out the illegality of her proposal, the logistical challenges of moving all our belongings, and the fact that she had taken actions without my consent that were entirely unnecessary. It was evident that this could potentially lead to severe consequences for me. Her responses lacked any valid justifications, leaving me dumbfounded and disillusioned by her words. My fiancé and I contacted the law firm immediately, sharing every detail of the situation. To our dismay, we learned that she had attempted similar actions with three other individuals, resulting in their banning from Canada. Consequently, she had already been on probation within the firm. Later that day, we received a call from the law firm, informing us that the lawyer had been terminated and they would initiate the process of having her disbarred. We also shared our entire ordeal with the consulate, and it seemed that something substantial had been conveyed during the firm's communication with them. Remarkably, the law firm compensated our entire case, granting me permanent residency free of charge. Not only did we manage to secure our legal status, but 
We also successfully got the lawyer fired and eventually disbarred for her negligence and other charges. With these burdens lifted, our family is now happily together, planning our wedding. It was a relief to discover that justice prevailed and we could move forward with our lives. In an attempt to maintain confidentiality, I will refer to my workplace as Blue Pet, a pet store where employees wear blue uniform. Having worked at Blue Pet for over two years, I have accumulated a total of six-plus years of experience in customer service and retail. Throughout my working years in Canada, I have held various positions in grocery stores, food establishments, and restaurants. However, what I experienced during this particular incident was unprecedented. Although I was initially a part-time employee, circumstances led me to work 30-40 hours a week due to new hires quitting or other reasons that escaped my memory. It was during this period that Blue Pet implemented a new rule requiring us to use transparent water bottles, ensuring that our consumption of water was easily identifiable. The rationale behind this rule, presumably, was to prevent any misunderstandings where customers might mistake our beverages for something else while we assisted them with their pet care needs. To comply with the rule, I needed to acquire a transparent water bottle. So one day, on my way to work, I decided to make a quick stop at a dollar store located in the same strip mall as my workplace. In Canada, it's a well-known fact that regardless of the dollar store's name, whether it be Dollar Tree or Dollarama, they all share a common green-themed branding. The employees don regular t-shirts paired with vibrant green aprons. At Blue Pet, on the other hand, we wear collared blue uniforms with either black or khaki pants. Our shirts bear our name tags the Blue Pet logo, and occasionally we adorn them with Blue Pet pins to signify seniority, achievements, or other approved miscellaneous pins. Unbeknownst to me, I had forgotten about the transparent water bottle rule, hence my rushed visit to the dollar store solely focused on finding a temporary solution. As I entered the store wearing my Blue Pet uniform, I realized that the colors clashed with the unmistakable green theme of the dollar store. Undeterred, I proceeded to search for a cheap water bottle until I had the opportunity to purchase a better one elsewhere. Engrossed in my task, I was interrupted by an older woman who sought my assistance. Her, excuse me, young lady. Me, yes, responding with a tone that conveyed my urgency rather than professionalism. Her, there's no need for rudeness. Where can I find? Me, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't work here, pointing to the blue pet logo on my uniform. Her but you're wearing a name tag. Oh, well, I guess I'll have to find an employee who actually wants to help me. I brushed past her, determined to locate the water bottles. However, my mission was interrupted once again, this time by a woman in her 30s or 40s, accompanied by her 12 or 13-year-old child. It was apparent that English was not their first language. Her, excuse me, ma'am, where can I find the birthday bags? With a hopeful tone. Me. Nee. They are located on the back wall toward that side, gesturing toward the far wall to provide a visual reference. She thanked me for the assistance, and they continued on their way. Finally, I managed to grab a plain water bottle and proceeded to the checkout counter. To my surprise, I was once again halted by the same older woman from before, this time accompanied by her husband, who apparently witnessed my interaction with the woman and her child. Both wore scowls on their faces. I shrugged off their discontent. Working in retail and customer service tends to diminish one's concern for individuals' unreasonable dissatisfaction. During that same visit, I was stopped by at least two other individuals, separate from the aforementioned incidents. While I understand that busy environments can lead to confusion, one would think that if someone was wearing a distinctly different uniform, not even remotely resembling that of the store's employees, it would serve as a clue that they do not work there. Moreover, I was shopping and my Blue Pet logo was prominently displayed on my attire. The entire experience left me bewildered beyond words. While I was on my break from work, I was going to go to the Starbucks close by to get a water. Unfortunately, they closed right as I got there. I was heading back to the store when I saw a smoothie bar I had never tried before and decided I would buy one. My mistake was not bringing my wallet because I usually use Apple Pay. 
So after ordering my smoothie, I find out that they don't have Apple Pay. I was bummed and said, never mind, as it was already close to the end of my break and I could come back another time. The guy behind the counter, who was super sweet, said I could pay on the website, so I tried. And for whatever reason, the website kept saying my card was expired, even though I knew it wasn't because it doesn't expire for another two years. So I let him know that it won't take my card and I'll come back another time, and he goes, go ahead and just take it. It's on me. I thanked him and told him I'll make sure to bring my card next time, and we had a good laugh. Here comes Karen. She starts demanding a free smoothie from him because he gave me one. I felt horrible and walked over. Nay, he doesn't have to give you anything. He gave me the smoothie because he was being nice. You can't just demand something free of charge because he made a kind gesture. Cue Karen yelling at me. She demanded to know who I work for. I was wearing my uniform so she could get me fired. The manager heard what was going on and came out. After explaining what happened, he kicked Karen out. Thankfully, the employee didn't get in trouble for giving me the smoothie. The manager was super chill about it, which was a relief because I've seen managers throw employees under the bus, and I've experienced it too.